Hello, everyone, and welcome to IT Energy Savings for Non-Techies, Identifying and Understanding Opportunities to Reduce Costs. My name is Gabriela Bosio, and I am the Communications and Education Manager at Second Nature. This webinar is sponsored by Energy Star and hosted by Second Nature in partnership with Alter Action Inc. Today, we're going to start off with a short introduction to Second Nature, followed by a presentation from Mike Walker, President of Alter Action. Alter Action is an Energy Star technical support contractor. At the end, we will have 20 minutes for questions and answers. Please remember that you can submit questions for the Q&A at any time using the question function on your GoToWebinar panel. This webinar will be recorded, and the recording and slides will be shared in the days following this presentation. Next, please. Okay, so who are we? Who is Second Nature? Many of you already know us and work with us, but for those of you who do not, um, Second Nature is a Boston-based nonprofit. Our mission is to build a sustainable and positive global future, and we do that by working with leadership networks in higher education. What does that mean? For example, our signature program, the American College and University President's Climate Commitment, also known as ACUPCC, is a network of nearly 700 institutions whose presidents have committed publicly to eliminating net greenhouse gas emissions and embedding sustainability into their operations and curriculum. And that is one of the main ways in which we work with leadership networks in higher education to promote sustainability and climate action. For anyone who would like more information on this program and how to become a part of this leadership group, which spans all 50 states, please contact me using the email on screen or visit our websites, secondnature.org and acupcc.org. And now I'll leave you with Mike Walker from Alter Action. Well, thank you, Gabriella. Can you hear me all right? Great. I assume you can hear me. Um, I, I want to thank Second Nature for, for giving me this soapbox today. I want to talk to you a little bit about IT energy savings with a particular focus on uh, those of you who don't necessarily work in IT, and in fact, this, this webinar really is geared towards people that know how to turn on a computer, know how to use it for their job, but really that's about it. So um, my hope is that by explaining some of the ways you can save energy with IT um, and giving you some thoughts on ways to, um, to get your organization behind some of these initiatives, that together we can make a difference in energy efficiency and in and, the and larger sense in, in our carbon footprint. So before I get into the technical details, it's probably a good idea just to give you a quick sense of, of who we are and where we're coming from. So uh, my company is called Alter Action. Uh, we work on behalf of EPA's Energy Star program. Uh, we're called technical support contractors. Um, how did we get into this business? Well, we, we have three areas of expertise that kind of uniquely fit us into this um, bit of work in IT energy efficiency. And one is we do have a lot of experience with IT management and consulting. Um, but first and foremost, our firm is about large scale human behavior change. So our uh, clients ask us things like how do we convince people to drive electric cars, or how do we convince people to uh, put curly uh, energy efficient light bulbs into their, uh, their homes, these sorts of things. Um, and we do have quite a bit of experience with sustainability. Um, because we are funded by EPA's Energy Star program, which is government backed, um, we really have to be vendor or product or solution neutral. So I'm not here to sell you any particular solution to some of these uh, opportunities to save energy in IT, and in fact, quite the opposite. I'm here to, to help you understand the opportunities and to give you some, some uh, ideas for moving forward so that um, you can pick the best solution or product or vendor for your own needs. And uh, last but not least, our services in providing this webinar, we are, we, they are free. And I'm going to describe some other services you can take advantage of uh, today uh, that are also free. So more on that later. So you may not really think of Energy Star when you think about IT and maybe IT energy efficiency advisors. You probably think about Energy Star when you look at a refrigerator or an AC unit or something like that. Um, but it turns out that um, the Energy Star team actually developed the first system that centrally manages 
PC power settings, and I'll be telling you more about that. Um, my team works very closely with Microsoft to improve the way Windows and Vista, uh, pardon me, Windows Vista and Windows 7 and now Windows 8 use uh, energy. And we have uh, developed Energy Star ratings for a number of technical products, and you'll hear a little bit more about this later. But um, you probably knew, again, that AC units and refrigerators and even computers and monitors could earn the Energy Star, but in addition, UPS systems, uh, which are data center systems, uh, servers, copiers, printers, and, and soon some other data center equipment will earn the Energy Star. And then in our role as technical support contractors, we've helped hundreds of organizations um, implement some of the uh, pardon me, some of the uh, measures that I'm going to describe to you today. And they, there are large companies, small companies, uh, universities, tons of schools, uh, state government, all sorts of organizations. So the main reason we are here today is there is an enormous potential to save energy in and around IT. But those savings are largely untapped. And even though we've been talking about IT energy efficiency for, for better than uh, 12 years now, um, there's, a, there's several main reasons why th there's still such a big opportunity here. And the, the first one I, I call misaligned incentives. And to put, to put it more, um, you know, uh, simply, basically the people that make decisions around IT equipment, namely data center managers or IT managers, almost never pay the utility bill. And a lot of times when we're working with organizations to help them implement some of these measures, we're introducing the person that pays the utility bill to the person who makes decisions about IT equipment for the very first time. So um, if it's nobody's job in IT to think about energy efficiency, it's a job that tends not to get done. Um, in addition to this, the, you know, the lives of IT managers uh, are, are not simple. Um, and when you think about the security risks that they have to, uh, they have to contend with today, um, hacking risks, when you think about what happened with Sony Pictures Entertainment uh, this past year, um, there is a lot to worry about. And those priorities, first and foremost, have to do with keeping their networks safe and secure. So anything that is um, kind of above and beyond that is going to take a distant back seat. So that's the second problem. And the third problem, a little more subtly, is that energy efficiency is almost never in the training of an IT person. So there is a lack of expertise, and there, there's nothing particularly technically um, uh, challenging about energy efficiency when it comes to IT. But it does require an IT person to get up to speed on the different things you can do to save energy, and that alone can be a barrier. So the, the good news is we figured out how to move organizations past these barriers, and I'm going to share that with you today. So let's jump right into the good stuff. Um, four opportunities to save energy in uh, large organizations, and the first one I'm going to talk about is power managing network computers. I'm going to guess that most of you are familiar with this. I'm going to give you a quick overview of what it is, what it means, and then I'm going to spend more time later in the presentation talking about how you get this done in a larger organization. But the, the premise of computer power management settings goes something like this. You wouldn't leave your office at the end of the day with every single light on, would you? And, of course, the answer is no. Um, well, why do we do that with our computers? And it turns out that at least 60% of organizations out there actually ask employees to leave their computers powered on at night. And there's some reasons for that that I'll explain in a minute. What's a much better thing to do is to use power management features that are built into the operating systems. And these features automatically put an inactive computer into a low power mode and not just the monitor. So you may look around your organization in the evening and see a lot of black monitors. That doesn't mean that you're fully taking advantage of computer power management. That just means you're taking advantage of monitor power management. So it's important that you do both, and I'll explain more about that in a minute. Another key feature um, is that your computer will wake back up just with a quick touch of the mouse or keyboard. It's, it's far faster than booting a machine. 
Uh, these features are built into just about every operating system that goes on a, a desktop or a mobile computer. They go by various names, um, standby, hibernate, sleep. For our purposes, for saving energy, they're pretty much equivalent in saving energy. Technically, they differ, and I'd be happy to get into the differences if anybody has a question about that at some point. Here's the key. If you go out and buy a computer at retail, chances are these settings are already enabled. However, if you purchase computers as part of an enterprise, as an IT department, or from a company that provides IT services, um, these settings are almost never activated, and they have to be activated. So uh, you are not saving unless uh, you, you've verified that you are saving, I think is the message. And we found uh, through some survey work that we've done with Energy Star that 70 to 75 percent of offices in the United States look like this every night. Well, this is a computer lab at a school, but, but uh, the, the same holds true. Occasionally you'll see that the screens are black, but in, in fact um, the computer itself is still on. So if, if you could imagine each of these monitors and each of these computers turning into a $20 bill, and then how much money you would have if you went around and collected all of those 20s throughout an organization, maybe the size of the one that you work in, you get a sense of the amount of money that's wasted each year just from uh, not activating these sleep features. So, and you know, I'll talk about the savings range in a minute, but to take a little bit of mystery out of this, you could conceivably go into the properties in your computer and in some cases you can make these setting changes yourself. I don't recommend that for reasons I'll explain in a minute, but I just wanted to show you that these are features that you can access, generally speaking. This is a picture of a, an old Windows XP computer and when we say we want you to do computer power management, we're talking about system standby and or hibernate. These bottom two features, we're not talking about um, turning off the monitor, although we want you to do that too, and we're not talking about turn off hard disks. Again, I can field some questions about that in the Q&A if, if you're curious about the differences. So why would you do this? Well, the big reason is um, you will save almost certainly in the range of $10 to $100 per PC per year. That's an annual savings. Um, in addition, if you're in a climate where you do more cooling than heating, you're probably looking at an additional three to thirty dollars per computer in reduced cooling loads. If you pay peak load demand charges, um, computer power management can help bring those down. And of course, you will contribute to less air pollution and a, a smaller carbon footprint. Um, as you're probably aware, the way the electrical grid works in the United States is less demand means that uh, generators produce less electricity, which means that there is less uh, fuel burned and, and uh, less carbon emitted into the atmosphere. And I like to just add uh, that in federal agencies, they're actually required to use these features. So this isn't something that's cutting edge but yet we still know that most organizations aren't using these features for the reasons I described earlier. So just to give you a sense of how significant this, this is, if you looked at the typical energy footprint of an office building or a school, and, you, and if you look at the pie chart on the right, the smaller one, that is the typical energy footprint of a commercial office building, almost a third of it is office equipment. And if you blow that up and look at what is office equipment, well, almost um, a half and really closer to two-thirds is computers and monitors. So we've actually had buildings where we have done one thing. We've activated computer power management on their computer networks, and we've reduced the entire building's energy consumption by 10 to 15 percent. So it's significant. So I mentioned before, monitor power management, you may already be doing this. We know from surveys, you know, roughly 75% of organizations are doing monitor power management. If you're not, and the way you would know is if after hours you see uh, a screensaver or you see um, a, a lighted screen on computers, you're not doing monitor power management. 
Um, this is a big opportunity and it is a, a serious no-brainer. It's easy to activate. You don't have to worry about it interfering with any of the software uh, patching and updates that happen on your network. It saves 10 to $35 by itself, uh, not including computer power management. And you know most organizations are already using this, but it's important to make sure, and I can tell you how to make sure. So the focus of today really is computer power management. And know that, yes, it's a little more challenging from a network and technical perspective, but it's also more saving. So you drop the power draw of a typical computer down to 1 to 3 watts from 40 to 100 plus watts. Um, the machine wakes up in just a few seconds. You don't have to ha wait for it to reboot. Um, and we'll see 10 to $40 worth of savings uh, per computer just from the computer power management piece of this. And when you combine that with monitor power management, you're looking at real, real money. This is an example of what it looks like in Windows 7 to control the power options. And, and they simply, uh, they've combined the hibernate and sleep features that you used to see in XP. And they just say put the computer to sleep. So, um, you know, I've thrown a lot of terms at you, monitor, computer, sleep, uh, et cetera. What does EPA recommend? Bottom line is you want to set your display to enter sleep mode somewhere between 5 and 20 minutes after it's inactive. In other words, the computer is no longer receiving any input from a user. And then you want the computer to enter uh, system standby or hibernate or sleep after 30 minutes of inactivity. So first the monitor goes out and then the computer. Um, we, we tell people to disregard that setting that's called turn off hard disk. It just doesn't save any energy really. Nothing appreciable. And you want to make sure that you're changing the profile, um, the power profile for AC, which, which means plugged into the wall and not just on battery. But obviously, you know, if you wanted to go lower than this, if you wanted the display to enter sleep mode after four minutes, or you wanted the computer to sleep after 15, know that you save more energy, but you have to balance the user experience. So the user experience of coming back to a computer that goes to sleep every two, two minutes can be uh, a, a bad experience. So we found really, you know, going back, this is kind of the best mix of user experience and energy savings. So why is it that most organizations still aren't doing this? Two big challenges. One is, in a large organization, it would be um, really prohibitively labor intensive to walk around and make these setting changes on everybody's computer. When you get into thousands of computers, even if it just takes two minutes to make this change on each computer, you're getting into a lot of labor. Um, the second challenge, and this is the more important one for you to be aware of, is that if a computer is asleep in that low power mode or if it's off, it can't receive those periodic window updates, security patches, antivirus definitions, can't run a backup. And that worries your network administrators for a very good reason. Um, here's the good news. There are numerous ways to get past both of these challenges. There's a ton of free ways to get past these challenges. Um, chances are in your organization you already have the tools to, to be able to do this. Um, and it's just a matter of getting people uh, kind of all uh, lined up to, to get her done. So anytime we talk about making an investment, even if it's just an investment of time, people's times, it's a smart thing to ask about return on investment. So when we talk about computer power management, in terms of return on investment, there's really two components to the cost. One is software. Now, I mentioned that these features are native in Windows and in Macs. You don't have to buy any new software necessarily. Sometimes, however, depending on your network environment, it's helpful to have some software solutions that manage these power settings and give you lots of different flexibility in how you manage those power settings. Worst case scenario, those, that software maxes out at about $15 per seat, which is kind of how in IT we talk about a computer. So it's call it $15, worst case scenario for each computer. And then we like to throw in labor costs simply because 
your even if if we help out and we will do this, we will help out your IT uh, group and we will make this as quick and painless as it can possibly be for them. But they still have to spend time with us on the phone, or they have to identify an appropriate solution for their unique network. There will always be, and there always are, uh, a handful of computers where they have a bad driver and something didn't work correctly, the machine won't go to sleep or whatnot. So troubleshooting those and so forth. Basically, all of these costs add up to maybe, worst case scenario, $20 per computer or per seat. And on average, we see $30 worth of savings per year, 30 to 40. If you figure the average age uh, of a serviceable computer is three to four years, you're looking at uh, you know 120 to 160 dollars of savings, versus worst case scenario, 16 dollars, uh, pardon me, 20 dollars worth of cost. So this is a real no-brainer. And in payback terms, you know you're probably looking at a payback of, of just a few months. So when I'm doing this presentation live, uh, often somebody stops me at this point and says, Mike, you're making this sound complicated, even though I'm trying not to. Uh, but, but wouldn't we just be better off asking people to turn off their computers every night, like physically turn them off, go to the start menu on a Windows machine and tell it to shut down? And the answer is no. Um, and the reason for that is these sleep features are so good that they take the computer down to effectively off in terms of power consumption. The, com the computer might use a watt or two. And what happens, and this, this is a little counterintuitive, but when you actually turn your computer off, by contrast, that computer still draws, it's called phantom load. And what that means is it still draws a watt or two of power from the wall, even when it's off. So the delta, or the difference between sleep mode versus off is pretty negligible. So now it comes down to uh, basically user compliance. And if your users forget to shut down their computer just a handful of times a year, they're gonna, gonna negate any savings gain they would have gotten from turning it off versus having it automatically drop into sleep mode. And we know from surveys and interviews with IT managers that even in organizations where they have a strict policy requiring that computer users turn off their computers each night they only get 70 to 90 percent compliance, best case scenario. So you're far better off having the machines automatically go into low power sleep mode. And that's what computer power management settings do. So a, a quick case study with uh, University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, who uh, is a signatory to the ACUPCC. Um, they have about 30,000 managed computers. They were leaving their PCs and monitors on after hours, so uh, burning a lot of energy at night when nobody was sitting in front of those computers, and then energy during the day as well. Um, what they did was they scheduled a call with one of our Energy Star technical experts who walked them through um, after learning about their network and, and some of the things they could do and some of the things they thought they couldn't do walk them through a native solution. What does native solution mean? It means this is a solution they already owned. It takes advantage of Windows 7 sleep features and Windows Server 2008. Um, if you're non-technical, you don't have to worry about that. But these are things that University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh already used. And we showed them how to achieve roughly uh, $76,000, $77,000 of savings annually just from those 3,000 managed PCs just by putting them into sleep mode when they are inactive. So I've talked at length about power managing computers and the reason for that is it's, it's arguably the largest opportunity for most organizations. You might be thinking, well, I thought data centers had you know, the big opportunities to save energy and that's true, but the fact of the matter is most of us don't run data centers. Um, a lot of the data center work that, that uh, happens in our organizations may take place in a different location or maybe even in the cloud. So uh, power managing network computers is the big one. Specifying Energy Star, for, and maybe I should pause now and just to ask Gabrielle, if it, do we have any questions at this point? I think 
think you may be muted. I'm sorry, it takes a it takes a minute to unmute. Um, we do have a few questions already. Would you like to take those now? Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to. Okay, so one of the questions that we have here um, regards the the savings that you were talking about. Is that a more modern, more efficient computer? Is that a sort of older XP, Windows, 2003 kind of computer? Oh, great question. So um, it's, you know, it's absolutely true that newer computers are much more efficient. So when I started thinking about computer power management 10, 12 years ago, a typical desktop, we didn't even have uh, much in the way of, of um, well, we had laptops, but but uh, they weren't as ubiquitous as they are now. Typical desktop computer could easily burn 60, 75, even over 100 watts of power. Now, on average, you went out to a, uh, a store and bought a new desktop, probably 45, 50, 55 watts of power is all it uses. Um, and some of the you know monitors now where they might have burned 300 pardon me uh, 100 watts three years ago um, uh, not three years ago with with uh, with CRT technology a little more than three years ago you know now you have an LCD monitor that burns a fraction of that so a big LCD monitor may only burn 20 30 watts of power the upshot is that on the low end, if you're an organization that has almost all laptops, so laptops use less than desktops, um, and people are really good about turning them off or they take them home at night, you're probably only going to see around $10 of savings per computer per year. At the other end, other end of the spectrum, you're mostly desktops and people are leaving them on at night you're looking at closer to $100 a year, especially if you live in the Northeast where we pay a lot of money for, for power or any of the other areas in the United States, California, where we spend a lot of money for power. There is actually a related question um, to that. Somebody was actually um, submitted a question where they're using laptops and they take them home, so there's no phantom load. So is there something else that's recommended for, they, they asked, turning off an entire cubicle? Yeah, and I, I'm actually going to, that's a great segue to some of these new topics, but I would also mention that when, when you use sleep features on computers, um, even if can people take them home at night, their they're desktops, uh, during the day, people leave their office for meetings, people leave their office for lunch, and so forth, so it's still worth doing. It's still something you are still going to see savings, but like I said, it's going to be closer to the $10 of savings per computer per year versus the 100 end, uh, you know, of that range. So would you like to um, segue into the next topic or would you like to take another question? No, why don't we keep moving and then we can come back to them at the end. So, um, or, or at, at my next logical stopping point. So let's talk for a minute about Energy Star for office equipment. I think the major point to make here, and this is pretty uh, quick, is that there are a lot of products that you would not think of as Energy Star products. Again, probably all familiar with computers being Energy Star potentially, um, but you know, you probably didn't know, for instance, that, uh, let's see if I can get this pen working. Um, bear with me here. So this is a vending machine. If you have a lot of vending machines on your campus, for instance, it is definitely worth asking uh, the vending machine supplier to give you Energy Star qualified machines. They use about one seventh of the power of a typical vending machine. This is a server. I think I may even have some data in a minute here on how much a server can save you if it's Energy Star versus standard. Uh, as you can see, I really can't draw very well with this, but this is attempting to be a circle. Um, this is a water cooler. And Energy Star water coolers save around $50 per year over a standard water cooler. So, um, you know, I encourage you if you're in the procurement space, or if you, um, you know, you think about office equipment, your your first question is, uh, do we have built into our vendor contracts a requirement for vendor? Then, uh, pardon me, Energy Star, and you should. 
Yeah, so here's an example. So we replaced, um, we worked with uh, Microsoft and HP on a, an experiment where we replaced a new Energy Star server. Uh, pardon me, we replaced about a three or four year old older server with a new Energy Star qualified model. We got many times the workload done with that newer server at less than half of the, the uh, power consumed. So it's very meaningful to, to get Energy Star. And I mentioned earlier, uh, for vending machines, if you operate a lot of vending machines, uh, quite a bit of savings here. $150 per year per machine is pretty typical. So you want to ask for Energy Star vending machines. And if that is not an option, there are retrofit kits to make a vending machine Energy Star. Or you can use something called a vending miser device. And that's a, we call it a plug through device. That's a device where the vending machine plugs into the vending miser and the vending miser plugs into the, the socket and it, uh, it controls the power that that machine consumes. So let's talk about, you know, some of you, you mentioned I think in the question, Gabriella, about uh, you know, turning off the, the entire cubicle. And so that's exactly what I want to talk about now, computer peripherals, and, and we call it miscellaneous plug load. So your best friend in saving energy in and around an office space uh, in, in a particular cubicle land is what we call smart power strips. And we see savings, it depends on how they're used, but somewhere between $10 and $100 per year. And by the way, these things cost on the high end, maybe 30 bucks each. So good investment. And there's three flavors of these uh, smart power strips. The, one of them works based on um, occupancy sensors. So it will, it has a little electric eye, it can sense when somebody's sitting at their desk, it can be set up to automatically shut off the switched outlets when it senses that, you know, somebody's no longer at the desk or has died. Uh, so if, if that's the case, everything gets shut, shut off and that could be fans, you know, task lighting, uh, things like that. Um, the second type is a, um, so there's occupancy sensing, a, ti a timer. Uh, device. So the device has a timer and it can be set, um, you know, to power everything off every evening at 7 p.m. or whatever you want it to, to be and, it, and everything can turn back on at 7 a.m. So that's great. My personal favorite is, is called the current sensing smart power strip and that's what's pictured here. So the way this works, it makes, it's a perfect companion for uh, a computer because you can plug the monitor into the master outlet here. And this device senses when that monitor goes into sleep mode. And as you recall earlier, that could be after five minutes, that could be after 20 minutes, but it's gonna happen um, you know, during the day when that monitor goes into sleep mode, it takes all the switched outlets with it. So if you have a printer, PC speakers, you know, God forbid, a space heater, uh, task lighting plug, plugged into those switched outlets, they get turned off. We don't recommend you plug a, the computer itself into that switched outlet because, you know, you might have been in the middle of something. You don't want your computer to lose power. You want it to go into low power sleep mode. You may not want it to actually be powered off. And that's what would happen if it was in the switched um, outlets. But the nice thing about these uh, is generally there are switched outlets and unswitched outlets. And I also recommend just plugging your phone charger into the un unswitched outlets. Um, as it turns out, one of the great myths of, of uh, energy efficiency is that it really matters to unplug your phone charger. It really doesn't. <laughs> um, long story short, phone chargers in the last few years have become extremely efficient. So if you are really good about unplugging your phone charger every time that phone was charged up and not leaving it plugged in a minute longer, you might save on the order of 10 to 50 uh, cents per year. So it's probably not even worth messing with. Oh, um, you should ask your utility if you are interested in exploring the idea of smart power strips, if they offer any discounts or rebates. A lot of utilities will work with you to help um, cover some of the costs of these devices. So I, I uh, live and work in a small town in Massachusetts. We have a, just a municipal utility, but periodically they will do a buy down where you can get these for $10, $15 each. Um, if you're a large organization, uh, you have more bargaining power. 
why do utilities want to pay you to use less electricity? It's complicated. Uh, it has to do with uh, the regulatory environment, environment of each state. But the, the, the basic idea is that it's cheaper for them to pay you to save energy than to have to build a new power plant. So printer consolidation, this is a great way to save energy, but also a great way to save uh, on maintenance costs. The idea behind printer consolidation is that the days of having a separate printer for everybody on their own desk are long gone. And you can dramatically reduce the number of printing devices in your organization. And the way you do that is you get rid of the, those high cost machines. Those are inkjets largely. Um, they, uh, you want to start using work group shared printers that are network connected. And you want to use multifunction devices, so you just use a lot less electricity, you save money on hardware, you cut maintenance costs and paper and ink and toner costs as well. And we will see um, savings from just doing this, from going to from an environment where just about everybody has their own printer to an environment where there are networked printers for every 10 to 20 uh, computer users, we'll, we'll see the total amount that they spend on printing and supporting printers, et cetera, et cetera, drop in half typically and sometimes even more. So last but certainly not least, data centers. Um, this really is a whole um, webinar in and of itself and, and maybe I'll talk, if, if, if people found this helpful, we can do a webinar on data centers targeted towards, again, uh, non-technical um, sustainability managers and, and uh, general managers, but I'm going to talk for a few minutes about data centers just to help you understand, you know, A, why do they use so much energy, and B, what are sort of the general things that you could do in a data center to save energy, and then I'm going to shift gears and just talk about how to proceed with any of these measures, you know, how do you get this done in your organization. So to the task at hand, Data centers use a ton of electricity, and just to give you, a, and the reason for that is that from an electrical perspective, computers are really inefficient, so they require a lot of electricity to, to power processors, but a lot of that power is wasted in the form of heat that's generated, and if you've ever had a laptop sitting on your lap for a long time, you, you get a sense of the fact that computers generate heat. So in a particular form factor, and in this example, we're talking about blade servers, which is a really small, densely packed type of server. Just one rack of these servers uses 28 uh, kilowatts of power and requires more cooling than two average U.S. households. Another way to think about that is it generates waste heat. Again, this is just one rack. And if you walk into a data center, you'll see potentially dozens, maybe even, you know, hundreds of racks of computers. Um, generates waste heat equivalent to four Weber Spirit barbecue grills. Uh, so you can imagine it, uh, one of these, uh, you know, server racks looking a little bit like the picture on the right here. And I think if our numbers are right, you could use the waste heat from one server rack to cook about 280 hamburgers per hour. So that's why data centers use so much of energy, they generate all of this heat that has to be uh, dissipated. So when we talk about saving energy in the data center, the place you want to start is that IT equipment. And the reason for that is we spend a lot of money supporting that IT equipment in the data center, removing the heat that it generates, etc. So if that IT equipment is really efficient, you have less AC to worry about, you have less airflow to worry about, and so forth. So the first and foremost category of energy savings is to make sure you have energy efficient IT equipment. And I already told you about Energy Star servers. There are a bunch of other uh, ways to save energy with IT equipment. I'll give you a summary in one sec here. The second major area of opportunity is airflow management. Think about it this way. If you've ever sat in a hot college dorm room <laughs> and you've had a window unit AC, it makes all the difference about, uh, in terms of your comfort, it makes all the difference depending on where the vent in that AC unit is pointed. So airflow management in a data center is similar to that. It's about pointing the cold air and getting it into the, uh, the, 
the openings in servers as effectively and as efficiently as possible so that air can flow through servers, cool it off, and then it's about effectively removing the hot exhaust air that comes out of the back of a server and getting it back to the AC unit to complete the cycle. So you want to move air as efficiently as possible, and you may be familiar with the fact that a lot of data centers have raised floors. In other words, there are floor tiles, and beneath that there's space. The reason for that is it's very efficient for cold air to be delivered to all those racks of computers underneath the floor. And the cold air flows underneath the floor and then is directed up into those server racks through these vented tiles. Last but not least, HVAC and humidity adjustments. We used to think that servers and data centers needed really cold conditions to operate effectively. We worried about them failing if the temperature got too high. And what's happened over the past 15, 20 years is that these servers, we've learned that they're much more tolerant than we thought, and they've actually been engineered to be more tolerant. So uh, if you still walk into a data center and you're cold, and you know, we used to have data centers where there was literally a coat rack for you to put on a coat as you walked into the data center. If you're cold in your data center, there's a good chance you're overcooling it. Um, most, uh, I believe the, the standard body that, that uh, thinks about these things recommends, you know, in the 80 degree range for data centers now. Um, there are lots of uh, gotchas and so forth. That, that's not a, a, a hard and fast rule, but generally if you walk into your data center and you're cold, there's a missed opportunity. So we've compiled descriptions of really that we call it the top 12 data center energy efficiency opportunities. And you can find it at the website, uh, energystar.gov slash low carbon IT. You can go there and read non-technical descriptions of each of these things. So if you are not a data center person or even an IT person, you can engage your colleagues in a conversation about these. Um, and then we've tried to provide impartial information about the costs of doing these different measures, the savings you can expect, and then some of the implementation considerations, things you need to keep in mind if you're going to do this stuff. Um, and like I said, we also do a, a full webinar on uh, data centers, um, and maybe Gabrielle and, and I can talk about uh, offering that as well. So. Um, how to proceed in your organization. So a lot of IT energy efficiency projects run off the rails. And um, in fact, a lot of you on the phone may have had the experience where you've, you've approached your IT person, and, like this poor guy, and, uh, and said, you know, hey, I heard about uh, computer power management as an opportunity. Um, sounds like a no-brainer. What do you say? And, and you could hear something like, uh, you know, um, this indecipherable <laughs> technical mumbo jumbo, uh, and you know the, the problem is that, as I mentioned before, IT has a lot of competing priorities, and this is not one of them. And as a result, the conversations you might have had with might have sounded like, yeah, you know, sounds like a good idea, but then you know, followed by a string of tech talk that without any technical training would be incomprehensible. And you don't know if that's a good reason or a bad reason or a reason at all. So this is what you need. You need to have an IT expert on your side. So what I recommend you do is if you talk to your IT colleagues and you get a wishy-washy answer or a no, simply say, hey, you might be right but we've got access to a free energy efficiency expert specifically dedicated to IT energy efficiency, and we can get them on the phone. Why don't we, would, you, would you be game for a 30-minute call with one of these Energy Star vendor-neutral tech advisors? That's kind of hard to say no to, even if you're a busy IT person. So hundreds of schools have taken us up on this, literally hundreds of schools, and I'd say within the first half hour to one hour, um, we generally take the IT person from, um, and this isn't always the case, but typically they're, uh, they're uh, you know, not sure they should be on this call. <laughs> They've got a hundred other things to do. We take them from having lots of concerns about computer power management or any of these other things that we've discussed to um, being on board and having a clear uh, path forward, what we've done is we've saved them a lot of time. 
um, we've saved them time kind of researching the various options that, that they would have to look into to make this happen on their unique network environment. So to summarize, steps for getting everybody on board. First of all, understand where you're at right now. So do a little walkthrough. Look for some of these savings opportunities that I've described. If you're going to look at computer power management, understand what the settings currently are. If you hear some technical objections from your colleagues in IT, you know, the, the answer is, hey, you know, you might be right, but why don't we just feel it out with a technical expert and then you schedule a call with one of our vendor neutral tech advisors and we can address all of their concerns, answer all of their questions, and help them find the best path forward given their unique uh, technical environment. So then I recommend, you know, you look at the return on investment. It's an incredibly positive project almost always. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen a payback that was more than a year. And we've got savings calculators to help you do that. And then, you know, I recommend you get some uh, allies on board. You know, perhaps if you work in facilities, you talk to somebody in finance. Perhaps if you work in sustainability, you talk to somebody in facilities. Um, but that's that's really the way to move forward. And then I want to give us plenty of time for questions, so I'm going to stop here. This is my contact information. Again, I'm Mike Walker. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you have questions about anything you've heard. And um, what I'd like to do now is go back to Gabriella and ask if she wouldn't mind uh, sharing any additional questions that came in. And I'll do my best to answer them. Yeah, of course, Mike. So I think one of the biggest questions that we're, we're getting, we've got this question a couple times, is can the IT department do their updates at night if the computers are in sleep mode, or do they really need the machines to be on all the time? And oh, how yeah. do I approach that? Yes, great question. Um, and I, I was remiss in answering it during the presentation. So. The, the answer is yes. There are all sorts of ways for those machines to be kept up to date um, and uh, patched, if you will, even if they are sleeping at night. And not to get too technical, but there, there's basically three general ways of doing this. Let me just leave it there. I'm not going to get too technical. I will say that if you talk to Microsoft, for instance, about network best practices, they do not recommend that anybody leaves their computers powered on 24-7 for patching. That's old school. We, we might have done that as, as network advisor or as network administrators 10, 15 years ago. It's inadvisable now, not just for power consumption reasons, but for security reasons and a whole host of other reasons. It's just not a best practice anymore. So even if you don't care about energy efficiency, you really should not have people leaving their computers on all night. I will, I will let, let me contradict myself. <laughs> Occasionally, you will have applications that need to run all night. Um, so if you're doing the search for extraterrestrial life and you're crunching a lot of data <laughs> on your computers overnight, um, yeah, you may have a few computers in your organization, maybe in your research laboratories that need to be left running all the time. But in, in you know, Almost every instance that we've uh, come across, those computers are tend to be a small fraction of the total number of computers in an organization. Great. Well, we have a kind of related question here about um, your experience at universities where some of the computers don't have typical operating hours. How do you best identify what time to put it into sleep mode? Yeah, so th the beauty of sleep mode is it can be pretty granular. So what I mean by that is you can set up different groups of computers to have different sleep profiles. So um, if you have, you know, a computer lab and you know that that's going to be pretty active until, you know, 11, 12 p.m., there are several ways you could, you could address this. You could simply, you could have the, the computer go into a low power sleep mode at any time and just tell the users that to, to start working on a the computer they need to shake the mouse and wake up the computer. Not a big deal. Or if you wanted to, you could put them in a group where the machines don't go to sleep unless they've been idle for an hour. So you have a lot of flexibility in setting those, we, we call them uh, timeout times. So, um, 
There was another question that concerned working with hospitals. Um, do you have any experience working in those kind of settings where they need to have always ready patient care computers? That's kind of a, a related question as well. Yeah, yeah, we do quite a bit actually. We've worked with a lot of large healthcare organizations, a ton of hospitals, and and yeah, that is a pretty typical concern. Um, yeah, incidentally, we've even worked with the Department of Defense on this, and they had all sorts of uh, of strange sounding reasons why you might not want a monitor to go into sleep mode. Something having to do with incoming missiles, and I'm not making this up, but um, we won't talk about that. The question was about healthcare, um, so. In, in hospitals, you know, a couple of answers. One is machines wake up so quickly from sleep mode that it is possible to, to use sleep mode even in a clinical environment where you've got people looking at screens, you know, all the time. So it may be that you can make uh, computer sleep work. It's also po possible, however, that a provider is going to have to log back into the network each time that computer goes into sleep mode, and that that's undesirable. You know, it's a bad user experience that the doctor's just coming in and out of the office sometimes. Sometimes, sometimes it's a good user experience for for security reasons. But if the organization's more interested in having those computers instantly accessible, we recommend that they put the monitor into sleep mode. Um, so that it wakes up instantaneously whenever they need it. They don't have to log back in. And then you have the computer power management piece of it set to go into low power sleep mode at, at the end of the workday. So, and it's possible to do that a couple of different ways. One is you can just tell that the machine that it needs to go to sleep at 7 p.m. Or you can tell the machine that um, it needs to go to sleep after an hour of inactivity. And that virtually assures that, you know, it's never going to sleep during the day. So we have another question here, um, this one regarding VPN. Um, the person wrote, I am always told that there is nothing they can do with computers that people use to VPN to. What are solutions for this challenge? Yeah, um, it's not true that there is nothing you can do, but it does complicate. So, so just to expand on the question, I, I, my assumption is it's, it's a scenario, something like this. You have a desktop in your office inside the network, you know, at, at work that you need to remotely access at night. So you get onto your home computer and you remotely access that computer um, through a virtual private network or a VPN. So the question is, you know, can you really have that computer in your office ever go into sleep mode because you need to wake it remotely? So there's two solutions to this. There's an easy solution, which is for those computers that people actually do VPN into quite a bit. Um, you just don't use computer sleep settings. You use monitor sleep settings, but not computer sleep settings. The slightly more um, challenging, but but better in terms of energy efficiency solution is that um, there are a bunch of solutions out there that will let you wake a computer remotely, even from outside the network via a VPN. And that's one of the things that our technical folks get on the phone and explore with your IT department. So if you're interested in moving forward with computer power management, I hope you are, and that is a concern from your IT department, you can literally tell them, don't worry about it, don't spend any time, any of your valuable time researching this, get on the phone with one of the Energy Star tech support contractors, and, and they've worked they, they figured this out for countless organizations, and they've got all sorts of tricks. Um, so there, there are ways around that problem. And Mike, is there any incentive to managing services in the cloud uh, from an efficiency perspective? Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, um, and, and the, you know, with that caveat, generally speaking, most cloud um, computing providers uh, operate very efficiently and the reason for that is they operate at enormous scale and a little bit of efficiency goes a long way so we'll see organizations like Google, Amazon, uh, Intel, uh, Microsoft invest quite heavily in efficient data centers um, because power is their, I believe it is their first or second uh, most expensive variable cost. Uh, and it competes with labor, so it's it's up there. Um, 
I can't remember if labor's first or if, or if energy's first, but regardless. Um, so yeah, generally speaking, moving to a cloud solution saves society energy and reduces our, car, our collective carbon footprint. Certainly from a, the narrower perspective, it's going to save uh, electricity you know, for your company. Uh, so you know, that is something that you should factor in uh, when you're looking at possibly moving applications to the cloud. Is you, there's some energy savings and some uh, you know, uh, computing savings locally. So we got a question, and maybe it's worth uh, reminding people. Uh, we got a question about how to contact the vendor neutral experts that you were talking about. Um, so you are the vendor neutral experts. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that and how people can reach you? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad. That's a great question because um, so the Energy Star website is a big, <laughs> a big and sometimes confusing place. If you go to this link that you see on the screen right now, energystar.gov slash lowcarbonit, you'll see a, a number of the things that we talked about today. We, you actually land on, I think, five or six ways to save energy in IT. And what you can do is you'll find uh, on that page, or on maybe on the page about computer power management, you'll find a way to reach a technical expert. If you can't find it, don't spend any more than a minute looking. Just send me an email. Um, because it, it's my team and the team of a couple of other Energy Star contractors that provide this service, so you can come straight to the uh, to the source. Great. And if there are, we do have a couple more minutes, but if there are questions that are left over that people really wanted answered and they we didn't get a chance to get to them today, um, what can we do about that? Yeah. So um, you can always email me. Um, you could, I'm sure Gabriella would be happy to, to receive an email from you. She could forward them to me. So, um, you know, I like to say that our webinars come with a lifetime guarantee. So if you, if you think of something a week from now, um, please shoot us an email. You know, one other thing I can add, if maybe for waiting for, for a final question or two to come in, when you go to the low carbon IT website, um, and you're interested in taking us up on our free tech support offer, you you will be prompted to take, it's called a pledge. Um, it's called the Low Carbon IT Pledge. It's just five questions. Anybody can answer it. It's non-binding. Um, if you can't answer the questions, I think there's some, you know, there's choices like uh, unsure at this point. But um, I, I mention this because sometimes people get to that pledge and they, they want to talk to one of our technical experts and, and it becomes a barrier for them. The point of that pledge is simply to learn a little bit about your organization so we're prepared to talk to you. Um, and it's certainly not to be some kind of binding commitment. So just keep that in mind if you get to that pledge. Um, we hope you'll just fill it out and, and uh, we'll be able to help you out. Of course, if you have any questions about it, you can contact me directly. Well, thank you, Mike. Um, we only have uh, like an, another minute left, so I just wanted to thank you for this great presentation, and I wanted to thank everyone who joined us today and remind you that if you have any questions about Second Nature's work or how to join the ACU PCC, if you are not currently a signatory, you can contact me. Um, the email address was on the first slide. These slides and the recording of this webinar will be shared with everyone in the following days. Um, my contact information is gboscio at secondnature.org. And um, we, I'm, I'm happy to field any questions or you know, forward any questions to Mike, um, but also to help you out if you're looking for any ways for your school to commit to sustainability in a public way. Um, so thank you, everybody, for joining today. And I hope you have a great rest of your day.